The Absolute at Large by Karel Chopik Translated by David Wiley Performed by Francis Bass Chapter 25 The Greatest War Ever, as they called it it's part of the character of us humans that, when we come across something very bad, we take special pleasure in calling it the greatest. If, for instance, the weather is very hot, we are grateful to the papers if they tell us it's the highest temperature reached since the year 1881, and we're even a little peeved at the year 1881 for having trumped us. Or if it's cold enough to freeze our ears off, we're filled with joy if we learn that it's the cruelest frost recorded since 1786. The same applies to wars. Either the current war is the most just ever, or it's the bloodiest ever, or it's the most successful ever, or it's the longest war since such and such a time. There is always some superlative or other at hand to provide us a certain proud satisfaction that we are living through something special and record-breaking. Now, the war that lasted from the 12th of February, 1944, to the autumn of 1953 really was, I swear it, quite easily the greatest war ever. Those who lived through the war deserve the joy of knowing this fact, and please, let's not take it from them. 198 million men fought in the war, and all these men, apart from 30 of them, died in it. I could cite you the figures and show how statisticians and officials tried to convey the enormity of the losses. I could tell you, for instance, how many thousand kilometers they would reach if all the bodies were laid next to each other, or how many hours a fast train would take to pass over them all if all these corpses were laid down in the place of railway sleepers or how many hundred train wagons would be filled if the forefingers of all the dead men were cut off and packed into sardine tins, and so on. But I have a bad memory for figures, and I wouldn't want to mislead you, not even by one miserable railway wagon. So I'll simply repeat that it was the greatest armed conflict since the creation of the world, both in terms of loss of life and of geographic reach. Here again, the chronicler feels the need to apologize for his inability to describe great offense in all their grandeur. He certainly ought to describe how armies swept across from the Rhine to the Euphrates, from Korea to Denmark, from Lugano to Hopperand, and so on. But instead of this, he would rather outline, for example, the arrival of Bedouins into Geneva, white burnouses on their heads, and with the heads of their enemies impaled on their lances two meters high, or the charming stories of hairy Frenchmen in Tibet, the cavalcades of Russian Cossacks in the Sahara, pilgrims from Macedonia and snipers from Senegal on the shores of the lakes of Finland, as you can see, there is material from many different places. The victorious regiments of Bobinet flew, so to speak, with Elan across both India and China in the steps of Alexander the Great, while the yellow flood of Chinese fought their way through Siberia and Russia to reach France and Spain, cutting off on the way the Muslims operating in Sweden and preventing their communication with their motherlands. Russian regiments, retreating from the overwhelming power of China, found themselves in North Africa, where Sergei Nikolaevich Zlochin established himself as Tsar. He was soon killed, however, because his Bavarian generals formed a conspiracy against his Ottomans from Prussia. He was succeeded as Tsar on the throne of Timbuktu by Sergei Fyodorovich Zlosin. Our own Czech homeland was occupied in succession by Swedes, French, Turks, Russians, and Chinese, each new conqueror murdering the previous one, down to the last soul. During this period, masses were held in St. Vitus's Cathedral by a pastor, an advocate, an imam, an archimandrite, and a bonze, None of them, of course, staying very long. The only welcome change was that the Stavov Theater was always full, albeit only because it was used as a military storeroom. In 1951, the Japanese were pushed out of Eastern Europe by the Chinese, and for a time there was a new empire of the center, which is what the Chinese called their homeland. Just by chance, this new empire had the same boundaries as the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, and there was once again an elderly potentate on the throne in Schönbrunn Castle, the 106-year-old Mandarin, Yaya Wirweana. The Wiener Mittagszeitung assured us every day that the nations rejoiced and looked up to his holy head with childlike veneration. The official language was Chinese, which put an end to nationalist disputes at a stroke. The state religion was Buddhism, and obstinate Catholics in Bohemia and Moravia, falling victim to Chinese dragon aids and confiscations, moved abroad. In this way, an exceptionally high number of national martyrs was created. On the other hand, there were some outstanding and courageous Czech patriots who were generously appointed to the rank of Mandarin such as Tobolka, who became known as Tobolkai, Grosh, who became known as Groshi, and certainly many others. This Chinese regime introduced many progressive innovations, such as issuing tickets instead of food, 
The empire of the center nonetheless collapsed not long after it had been established, as supplies of lead for munitions were quickly exhausted, and without munitions there was no authority. A few Chinese who had escaped the massacre remained in Europe in the period of peace that followed, most of them serving as a government official of some kind. Meanwhile, news came to Emperor Bobine at his new seat in Simla, India, that the unexplored reaches of the Irrawaddy, Siluan, and Mekong rivers were under the control of an empire of Amazon women. So he led an expedition there with his old guard, but never returned. Some say that he got married there. Others say that Amalia, the queen of the Amazons, cut off his head in combat and threw it with the bloody cry of "Satya te sanguin, kim tantum stisti." This latter version is certainly the less alarming. In the end, Europe became the theater for fruitless struggle between the Negro races who came rolling in from the African interior and the Mongol hordes. It is better not to speak of what went on during those two years. The last traces of civilization were erased. The number of bears living in Hradchani, for instance, on the left bank of the Vltava, rose to such a level that the few remaining residents of Prague demolished all the bridges, even Charles Bridge, to stop these bloody predators crossing to the other side. The population was reduced to a tiny fraction of what it had been. The forces in Vysehrad Castle were put to death. The cup final between Sparta and Victoria Zhizhkov was watched by a mere hundred and ten spectators. Other continents were no better off. North America, torn apart by astonishingly bloody battles between prohibitionists and anti-prohibitionists, became a colony of Japan. South America was under the control of empires based, in succession, in Uruguay, Chile, Peru, Brandenburg, and Patagonia. As soon as the ideal state established there by the English had collapsed, Australia did not meet its promise, but returned to being an uninhabitable desert. In Africa, once the Negroes had eaten more than two million whites, they hurled themselves from the Congo basin into Europe. While other parts of Africa were convulsed in battles between 186 different empires, sultanates, kingdoms, principalities, and republics, such is history. Each one of those hundreds of millions of people had gone through their childhood, their first loves, their hopes for the future. Sometimes they were afraid. Sometimes they acted as heroes. But most of them were sick to death of the whole thing and would rather have just been allowed to go to bed and lie down in peace. Certainly, those who died had no wish to do so. All that is left of all this is a handful of dry facts: a battle here and there, losses of so and so much, the outcome this or that, and whatever the outcome, it made no real difference to anything. And that is why I say you should not listen to those people when they proudly say what they lived through was the greatest war of all time. We all know, of course, that in a few decades' time, we will manage to create a war which is even greater. Even in that respect, man's achievements mount ever and ever higher. Chapter Twenty Six: The Battle of Hradec Králové. At this point, the chronicler will take the advice of August Sedlacek, Josef Pekarz, and other authorities in the writing of history, who point out that an important source for understanding history is the events that take place locally and reflect world events in a nutshell. This nutshell, better known as the city of Hradec Králové, is especially memorable for the chronicler, as it was here that he ran about as a nipper, where he went to high school, and at that time, of course, it was the whole world to him. But enough about that. Hradec Králové entered into the greatest war equipped with just one carburetor, and that was in the brewery, which can still be seen behind the Cathedral of the Holy Spirit, just next to the church residences. Perhaps it was the holiness of this neighborhood that made the carburetor produce beer in such quantities and of such a fiercely Catholic nature that it led the people of Hradec into a state that would have brought the late Bishop Brinik indescribable happiness. Hradec Králové, however, is too far from the center, and so it quickly found itself in the power of the Prussians, who, in a fury of Lutheran ardor, smashed the carburetor in the brewery. But then the city's new consecrating bishop was the enlightened Bishop Linda. So that the diocese was granted some historical continuity and maintained a pleasant religious temperature, even when the Bobinais, the Turks, and the Chinese arrived, Hradec Králové was proudly aware that one, it had the best amateur theater in the whole of Eastern Bohemia; two, the highest bell tower in Eastern Bohemia; and three, the pages of its local history show that it had the biggest battle ever in Eastern Bohemia. Strengthened by these thoughts, the city of Hradec Králové expected to be tested terribly in the course of the greatest war of all time. After the collapse of the Mandarin's empire, the city was led by the careful Mayor Skotchdopele. Even in the middle of all this anarchy, his turn of office was blessed with relative peace, thanks to the wise counsel of Bishop Linda and other venerable elders. Until that is, a certain young tailor came to the city. 
Hampel, his name was, born in Hradets, unfortunately, but from an early age he had been a wanderer all around the world and had even served in the Foreign Legion in Algeria. That's the sort of adventurer he was. He had gone with Bobine to conquer India, but deserted somewhere near Baghdad and slipped like a needle past the French, the Swedes, and the Chinese all the way back to his native city. So this tailor, this Hampel, had been in some way infected with Bobineism, and he had hardly arrived back in Hradets Kraleva before he started thinking of nothing but how he might gain power, just like his hero. The thought of sewing clothes now seemed very unappealing to him, so he started to complain and criticize this and that. He declared that everyone in the town hall was a time waster, that Mr. Skochdopole was a hopeless old fool, and so on. Sad to say, in any time of war there is a breakdown of morals, and all forms of authority are shaken, so that Hampel soon found a few people to support him, and with them he founded the Socialist Revolutionary Party. One day in July, this Hampel called a group of people together in one of the town squares, and, taking up position by the fountain, urged the need for, amongst other things, insurrection. Mr. Skochdopolo responded by posting announcements that no one had the right to give orders to him, the duly elected mayor, especially not some deserter who had just drifted into town, that it would not be right to announce a new election in these unsettled times, and that the courts were aware of that, and so on. Hampel, however, had been expecting this, and it was what he wanted in order, just like Bobine, to strike. He came out of his flat on the square waving a red flag, followed by two lads thumping with all their might on a pair of drums. Thus they proceeded past the main square, halted briefly outside the bishop's residence, and went on, all the time to the march of the drums, to the field known as Na Mlenke, on the banks of the river Orlitze. There he thrust his flagstaff into the ground, sat himself on one of the drums, and wrote down a declaration of war. He gave it to the two boys and sent them back into the town with their drums, where they were to read out his declaration at every suitable place. It read, in the name of His Majesty, Emperor Bobine, the royal city of Hradets Kraleva is hereby commanded to place the keys to all city defenses and fortifications into my hands. Failure to comply with this command before sunset will force me to proceed with my plans of attack, and at the break of day the city will come under attack from cannon fire, cavalry, and infantry. The lives and property will be spared only of those citizens who, before break of day, will have presented themselves to myself at my camp on the bank of the river Orlitze, bearing with them all arms and weaponry as may be needed, and swearing allegiance to His Majesty Emperor Bobine. Parliamentarians will be shot. The Emperor does not negotiate. General Hampel. The declaration was read and caused a deal of consternation, especially after the verger at the Church of the Holy Spirit had rung the bells out from the White Tower to sound the alarm. Mr. Skochdopole went to see Bishop Linda, who simply laughed at him. Then he convened the city council to a special meeting where he urged giving General Hampel the keys to the city defenses. It transpired that no such keys existed. There had used to be a few old locks and keys in the town museum, but they had been taken away by the Swedes. At this worrisome stage in the proceedings, night began to fall. All that afternoon, and even more in the evening, people had been making their way through the charming alleyways down to the riverbank. I'm only going down here to see what this madman Humble looks like, they all said to one another when they met, just the same as you. When they arrived at the camp, they saw the meadows already full of people, and a lieutenant of Hampel stood by the two drummers receiving the oaths of allegiance to Emperor Bobine. Here and there burned fires, people's shadows moving around between them, and, in short, it all looked very picturesque. There were some who made their way back into town, clearly disappointed. In the night, the spectacle was even greater. Sometime after midnight, Mayor Skochdobola climbed the stairs of the White Tower. To the east, alongside the river, he saw a hundred guard posts and thousands of figures moving between the fires, which shed their blood-red light all around. They were obviously digging trenches. The mayor made his way back down, very anxious. It was clear that General Hampel had not been lying about the strength of his forces. General Hampel spent the night poring over maps of the city, and when dawn came, he strode out from the woods. Several thousand men had already formed into ranks of four, they still had no uniforms, but at least one in four was armed. To one side there were clusters of women, old people, and children. Hampel ordered the advance, and the air was instantly alive with the sound of bugles from Mr. Cherveny's world-famous trumpet factory. Hampel's forces marched out towards the town to the sound of a joyous march while the women went by the road. At the foot of the city, Hampel halted his regiments and sent a trumpeter and a herald ahead to present his demands. Non-combatants were to leave their homes. No one, however, emerged. The houses were already empty. The streets were empty. The squares were empty. The whole city was empty. General Hampel twisted his mustache and made his way to the town hall. Its doors were open. He went into the debating chamber. He sat in the mayoral chair. In front of him, on the green cloth, there lay sheets of writing paper waiting for him. 
and each sheet bore the following beautifully written words, and the name of His Majesty Emperor Bobinet. General Hompel strode to the window and yelled, Soldiers, the battle is ended. You have broken the armed hand wielded by the clique of pin-pushers who governed in the town hall. Our beloved town is about to enter an era of progress and liberty. You have discharged yourselves with greatness. Farewell. Farewell, the army replied, and began to disperse. There was also one of Hompel's warriors, who came later to be known as the Hompelman, who proudly returned to the mayor's house carrying a rifle on his shoulder that had been taken from a Chinese soldier. So it was that Mr. Hompel became mayor, although it must be said that it was thanks to the wise advice of Bishop Linda and the venerable elders of the city that even his cautious style of governing was blessed with relative peace in the midst of general anarchy. This recording is under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike License. Music was composed by Johann Halvorsen and performed by the United States Marine Band. The book was written by Karel Chopek, translated by David Wiley, and performed by Francis Bass.